All right, welcome to CSS. Uh, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to select and add rules to style sheets. You should be able to distinguish between document flow and flex. And you should be able to describe the box model. The box so, box model. indeed, the very same. So first thing, selecting and adding rules. Um, everything we do in CSS is based around these two things. What does it apply to and what do we want to do? Selector, rule, selector, rule, selector, rule. If we go back to what we were doing this morning, um, let's, uh, let's pull up that code again. Projects and this was in mod two. Did I say Barkwire? No, that was a different one. Anybody happen to remember offhand what I called that repo from this morning? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. There it is. Way to go. Bless you. All right, so I'm going to light server this. Perfect. If I wanted to show up, I also need to fire up the uh, server. So I'll go into the BarkWire API and serve it up. But elsewise, I want to take a look at some of the CSS that I did this morning. Selector, rule, selector, rule, rule, selector, rule, rule, selector, rule. So when I say selector, what's that doing? Yeah. Indeed. Margin top, half a rem. Cool. What elements do those apply to? Anybody know how to pronounce this? Paragraphs side and heading. All paragraphs that are direct descendants yes. of the header. So if I have, this is a p tag that is a direct descendant of a header. If I put it in here, it doesn't apply to that one. It's not a direct descendant. It's a direct descendant of H1, not of header. So let's talk about the different kinds of selectors that we can have. Someone give me an example of a selector that we can use. I'm using it all over the place here. If I'm selecting an element, I'm selecting it by. Yep. Specifically, it's tag name. So we can say tag based selectors are you just put the name of the tag, like body. Any one of these, body, header, H1, P, main, H2, UL, apply to every single one of them. Easy. Um, also, what's this? This one isn't an H1 inside of a body. What is that? Both. Both. It's a compound selector. This as well as this. And these can be complicated rules. This can be any paragraph that's being hovered over that's a direct descendant of a body. Oh, also H1s. And then I can say anything with a class of fart, whatever. I can just start chaining these selectors together. So I can do it by tag. What's that thing that I just did? Class selector. 
So I can get it by class. If I write this uh, dogs list here, let's say I have a couple different URLs. I don't necessarily want to apply it to every single one of them. So I can throw a class on it of dogs. And then I can say, cool, I would like to apply the following rules to anything with the dogs class. Someone who isn't Andrew, give me one that is a lot like this, but it's not class. ID. ID. So I could say that is there. I could say this is the add dog form. That's its ID. And then I would say. What's the, how do I select something by ID? The hash. Add dog form. What's the difference in class and ID? They're like almost interchangeable. Almost. Almost. Be a valid HTML document, every ID should be unique within a page. You can put use the same ID more than once, and your browser will work just fine. Um, you will get some kind of weird behavior in JavaScript, though, if you use one more than once. So don't do it. In fact, there's some hyper-paranoid people who say, don't use IDs at all anywhere in your HTML. I'm not one of these people, uh, but he's smart. It should probably be pretty damn rare, but um, something like a header logo, I don't really have a problem using an ID for that. You don't want to do one. Something like a form, something like an input in a form, those should be unique on a page. I don't mind that, but they otherwise kind of work the same way. What else? What other kinds of selectors can we do? These are like our fundamental ones, tag, class, ID, but we can kind of mix them up in some different ways that are kind of cool. You've seen one of them already, I just showed you. Direct descendant. So a direct descendant uses the um, uh, First selector, and then the little carrot, um, direct child. And we can use tags, classes, or IDs with that. Doesn't matter. There's direct descendant. What about indirect descendant? How to do that? Who knows? Let's say I did want to, in that example before where I put a P inside of here, I want to select that and that one. But they do need to be inside of header. Yeah. Ooh. We haven't talked about that one yet. The answer is no, but you should know about this one. Wildcard selector. Wildcard selector is the asterisk. That one also works. The wildcard matches, as it name kind as its name kind of implies, anything. So if for example I wanted anything that is a descendant of header. I could say a direct descendant of header, I could do that. This will match p tags, image tags, anchor tags, everything, so long as it's descendant of header. This ma matches every single element on the page. But I don't want every single one, I only want p tags that are somewhere within the purview of header. 
How about just put it right after? We'll say that's an indirect descendant. You just get rid of the little arrow. This one is any element that's a direct descendant of header. This is any element, period, that's under header. Direct, three generations, 500 generations removed. I would say if these are the only ones you know, that's not bad. There are some other ones, most notably, um, we'll call sibling selector. What? Is it the nth child one? child is what's called a pseudo selector. That's probably a good one to know. Sibling selector is uh, where you go something plus something at the same level. That one's real handy for, I have a list item. I want to target a list item that's a sibling of another list item. It's nice for setting up uh, spacing between them while like not targeting the first one. Uh, the one Andrew was just mentioning uh, is called a pseudo selector. And if you only know one of them, one of them and the child's probably a good one. Or nth of type. So how this works is I say I want to target all LIs that are a direct descendant of ULs and are the third one. I have 10 list items. I want to do something special with the third one nth child or nth of type. And th the difference here is nth of type will be uh, the third li that's inside of a ul, direct descendant. And the child is, if there was a div and a p, but this is the third one, then it matches the selector. There's some other cool shit you can do with that too, like all even ones or um, you can do like every third one starting after the first one. I would not worry too much about that though. They're possible. All right, so these are our kinds of selectors, all the different kinds of ways we can select shit. I'll give you one more. Another pseudo selector. Hover. Hover's a nice one for like when you have a link and you want to do something when you hover over it. That's how you do that. Is this always A? No, it doesn't have to be. It could be anything you want to hover over. So that could be a div, that could also be some class, it could be whatever. But if you do colon hover, then whatever these rules that you apply are only get applied if that element's being hovered over. That's kind of it. We can combine these in all sorts of wild ass ways and we can make rules that are, you know, 400 things long. That's sort of the long and short of it. Yeah, Arena. What's a div? Great question. So, we'll call back from Jesse's lesson. What is a div? Could be anything. We can replace anything with a div, but we shouldn't because the semantic definition of a div is.
Union und zur Ehe. what pretty much every element does. What makes this one so special? Yeah. It can be used for everything. Shouldn't be used for everything. Let's take a look. Be an element reference. Should only be used when what? There's no other semantic elements. There's no other semantic elements. If I see you use a div and put a class on it called header, I'm going to defenestrate you. <laughs> um, we, have, we have a tag for that. It's called header. Um, there's like you know roughly 100 HTML tags. That's a lot. It doesn't cover every single possible use case, though. So we have div as a generic container if none of these other ones match. That's rarer than you think. It's not none, it's not never, but um, I think it is like the ultimate sign of laziness to just use divs for everything. Because you couldn't be bothered to like even look to see if something was a better fit. And then there's a kind of companion to div. What's that? No, not section. Starts with an S, though. Span. What's span do? Also a generic container. That's for generic container that's in line. So we can think of this dovetails nicely with the next topic, but this is block content. Paragraphs, sections, headings, that's block content. Stuff that's supposed to flow, this is inline content. We use divs as a generic version of these. We use span as a generic version of these. Cool. Good question, Maria. What else? What else are you curious about selectors? Cool. Let's talk about rules. So there's fewer rules than you imagine. Um, it seems like there's a lot, but not really. We've got a few based around typography. We have a few based around colors. We have a few based around positioning. Not a whole lot else. It's a couple little things here and there. But um, a lot, all of them have roughly the same shape, which is some identifier. Uh, and every identifier in CSS is uh, what we call kebab case or dasherized. They're always uh, separated by dashes. Not jammed together, they're not camel cased, they're not anything else. Words are separated by dashes. Some of them are combined. So for example, margin, that margin zero, 
is a shorthand for margin 0, 0, 0, 0, which is a shorthand for margin top 0, margin left 0, margin right 0, margin bottom 0. That, that, and these four things are equivalent. We got some standalone stuff. We have some shorthands. And then values. We, uh, there's a couple different units that we use for values. For sizes, tell me some uh, size units you've seen. Pixels. REMS, what else? What was that? So, just a number. You really only, eh, no, you use that a couple places. I'm into that. Integer, now eh, number. Use them just decimal sometimes too. What other ones have you seen? Seconds, like for animations and stuff. Any other ones? Think about colors. Ooh, percent. Love it. What else? Hex codes. Hex codes. So hex codes are the ones that look like that's a hex code. Okay. What else have you seen? PC. PC? What's PC? Uh, it's like the, oh, Pikas? Yeah, Pikas. Jesus. I've seen that. It's really weird. It's Indeed. For that matter, points. Um, Pikas and points are a um, print sizing. It has absolutely no place on the web. Uh, I don't ever want to see Pikas or points anywhere in your stuff. I got spec uh, a design from a print publisher in Picas and Points once. I was like, what do you want me to do with this? <laughs> like, it's literally different on everybody's screen. That's why we don't use it on the web. But yes, that is a valid unit. What else for color? What ways can we specify a color? You can just use the name of a certain color. Sure. Color name. RGB. You can, RGB. I mentioned one earlier today that I really like for colors. HSL, hue saturation light. Do mental color math. Okay, so these are examples of units that we can use to specify something. So let's look at some of the ones we used. What's a rem? Almost. It's the opposite of that, actually. It's a root. M. M is a typography term where if you think of letters taking up little boxes, not all of them take up the same size, right? Some of them take up a bit, some of them take up only a little. Um, and so in practice, we make a little teensy box around an I, a slightly bigger box around an A, and the biggest character in every single typeface is an uppercase M. Takes up the whole size. Real handy thing to be able to specify things relative to. If you're doing it to your baseline typeface, that's or uh, type size, that's not a bad place to start. How big should this border be? How much padding should this have? Well, if you do it relative to your typeface, it's like a design freebie. Uh, if it's all in units of that, it's at least a good place to start. And we won't talk too much about design today, but we will at some point. Uh, design is not art. 
Designers aren't put on a beret and you draw good pictures. Design is exactly like programming. There's rules that you follow and like can break, but you're breaking established rules. And so you need to do it intentionally. Um, it's about problem solving and requires the exact same kind of creativity. It's just done with a visual language, not with some other kind of language. And you too can learn it. I can't draw to save my life, but I'm not a terrible designer. Um, so if that's like a blocker that you have, start softening that. You too can design, it's fine. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we try to keep consistent scales. Friends help us do that. I'm using HSL here. I'm using a number here. I'm using percents there. Key, value. If you're ever curious about what things you can do, there's kind of a cool way to uh, check it out. I'm going to say localhost 3000. I am on Rails. Dergs. Oh shit, I had to um, down here, port 9000 Rails S. If you're ever curious about what you can do with something, easiest way to do this is open up the element inspector built into your browser, and this little guy right here, what it does is it lets you click on things, and then it shows you what the HTML for that probably looked like. And you have all these styles that are being applied to it. You can see the rules here. Any rules that match it, uh, or any selectors that match it, and any rules that are being applied to them. So H1 is inside body and also to have margin and padding. Well, what if I give them a buck ton of padding? You can play around with that and just sort of see what happens. All right, I downloaded three weights for that font. It's 300 now. Does it look like it's 400? Does it look like it's 700? Yeah, back to three. I want to add another rule to that. If you uh, click on that and press Enter, it gives you hints of like what kinds of things you can do. So I want to set the color of that. Um, and I get these suggestions here. I can also HSL it and say, I want to make it red. Um, half saturation, half light. Oh, beautiful. Just looks great. What happens if I lighten that up? I do 60. All right. What about 70? What about 80? All right. It starts pinking out a little bit. So, all right, what if I increase the saturation? Gets a little bit more Barney-like uh, until it looks like clown shoes, McDonald's. So I go the other direction, it starts pastelling until it's gray. And if I start rotating this around, I start seeing the colors in between. So I'm getting closer to green, now I'm green, now I'm super green, now I'm starting to get back to blue, now it's super blue, now it's getting almost purple, now purple is becoming back to red again. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Um, let's go to the Denverite. And I want you to open up your dev tools and I want you to use this little selector tool and I want you to click on stuff. Start changing the colors. Start adding some rules. See what it does. Play around with it a little bit. So let's take five minutes and just play. God damn right.
man, they are way better than New York Times about semantics. New York Times semantics sucks. I just got some fruit water, and I was like, oh my god, there's chunks of fruit water. <laughs>
All right, so let's wrap a little bit. Anything curious come out of that? Any things you were trying that weren't working? What did you learn the last five minutes? Yeah, Arena. Oh, wonderful. What's CSS stand for? Cascading development. Cascading. So that means we can do something up here and it cascades to things below it. Um, that also means you can override things. So if I say that on this app, let's see, the background color for the header should be whatever I did over there, that kind of like purpley thing. But then I say, no, actually the background color should be this kind of thing. So that'll override the color. And in fact, I can even say, nope, psych, the background color is entirely going to be that color. And it'll override it. And it's pretty common when you're building a style sheet is you go, all right, this is a general rule, except in this case, I'm going to override it there. And your browser will show all of the rules and it'll cross out the ones that were overridden. Great question. What else? Cool. So I don't think I'm going to get time for the box model, which is too bad. Um, but tons of great reading on the box model out there. This document flow and flex flow thing, that's the one that's going to bite you as you're trying to figure this out. So let's say we have. A document and we're trying to lay something out that's got something there and something there and something there and something here and something here and inside of that thing it's maybe got something there, and then some content there. Okay, we see apps that look like this all the time. Um, when you're trying to figure out how you style them, and this is the most important part, so I'm gonna say it three times. Figure out where the boxes are. Figure out where the boxes are. Figure out where the boxes are. Oh, it's a good idea. It is a good idea. <laughs> it's not just a good idea, it's the law. Yeah. So, um, quick history on CSS. It was added to the web three or four years in. Originally, uh, the web was a platform for sharing research papers and you could like link between them and stuff. You go, okay, cool. Um, what if we could style how they were presented a little bit? And so then CSS helps us do that. And then we start getting web pages, which kind of glorified documents, but really the same abstract concept. But then, 2001, we start getting web apps that are designed to be used like applications. CSS was never designed for that. Applications, you have a lot of control over your vertical axis. You have almost none in CSS. You don't control the vertical axis. You don't control the vertical axis. It's not as important as find where the boxes are. But you can't go uh, I'd like this to be at the top of the page, and this is the halfway down the page, and this is the bottom of the page. At least not easily. 
It's not how CSS was designed. You wouldn't do that in a research paper. So what we want to do is figure out where the boxes of content are. Is everything in CSS you treat like a box? And there's two types of boxes that we care about. We care about blocks. We care about inline. A block tries to take up as much space as it can. An inline block takes, or inline only takes up as much space as it needs to. So what do we think this one is? That blocker inline. Inline. Blocker inline. What about this one? Block. What about this one? What about this outer one here? Cool. What about this one right here? Cool. What about this in here? Block. Because it's attempting to take up as much space as possible, but it's inside of something that's in line. This is how we do this. Where are the boxes? Even when you're using cool shapes and circles and stars and all kinds of other shit, if you element inspect those, you gotta see a box. Some parts of the box are showing and some parts aren't. Lots of different ways to do that. But everything is fundamentally some kind of box. And your first task is figure out which of them are inline and which of them are block. For like 10 years, 15, God, almost 20. Close to 20 years is the only two tools we had. And so let's take a look at this top thing here. Got a logo here and then like the user icon here. All right, well, these are in line. I think we identified that correctly. But what about all this shit between? You try to use, do this with the HTML elements and styles at your disposal right now, you add that second one and that's gonna go right there. Hmm, rough. How would I solve that? Yeah. You like apply a align right kind of tag or something to it? Hmm. Kind of, sort of, but except you apply that to a the text in a in a box. So I can align the text right on this. That makes everything in this box fill up from this direction. It doesn't split these though. I can't say I would like to be aligned right within this. I would be like, like to be aligned left within this. Not with our basic tools. Yeah, Danica. Margins. So yeah, we could put a margin on this that pushes this all the way out. That's a way to do that. So I say margin right on this, and that means the next available space to add something becomes over there. How does that become brittle, though? How would you have done it? Ah, the thing you're describing is called absolute positioning. Mm. Yes. Yes, gotcha. So I say, I would like this to be uh, attached to the left side. I would like this one to be attached to the right side. Excellent. Now, let's see what happens when we do that. Um, get rid of these. 
pages. So I want something that kind of looks like that. And this is going to be um, All right, so first, tell me why this is below this. Is, that should be in line. Because it'll be the screen size. You sure? Because even if I uh, say that's my, that's a menu. And if I go over to my CSS and I say menu, I want to display that in line. Come on, man. Why are you making me look dumb in front of my friends? Exactly. This guy is taking up the whole line, so that's the next available space in the flow. So now, if I go over here and I make that H1 in line as well. All right, cool. Now they're side by side. So the thing that Danica was saying is, all right, well, what if I pin this to the left side and I pin this, or pin this to the left side, pin that to the right side? Do that with a tool called positioning. And I would say left zero and this one I say right zero. But there's a trick. Those don't do anything unless they're what we call absolutely positioned. So we say position absolute, position absolute. Oh crap, that kind of worked, <laughs> except, what the hell, those, those were like in before. Those had the same kind of padding on this as that. Okay, so, all right, I say left, one rem. Two rooms? Two rooms. So I can do that. Well, wait a minute, though. What about inside this? Now I also have to say bottom, uh, what's that, two? Oh, wait a minute. It flew right out of the box. What the hell, man? Oh, oh, crumb. So. Now, what I have to do is go over to the header and make this position relative, and then go back down here and say, okay, now bottom two rims? No, that's too far. Yeah, well, maybe, sort of. Still looks kind of funny, though. This happens every time you try to absolutely position something with left and right you just create a rat's nest that you end up digging through. This is like absolute positioning is our hack around the fact that we really don't control the vertical axis at all in a document. And this was the hell that we lived in for many, many years, is this nightmare of absolute positioning. Because when, when you absolute position something, you are saying, I don't want this to be in the document flow anymore. I don't want it affected by any other elements. I would like it to only be positioned relative to my instructions. Which I think for auteur is like you. Sure. Auteurs like you who are dealing with an audience that only has screens that are one exact size. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so we break document flow when we do that. Other things we could do, this is really common as well. We can add another element in here that doesn't have anything in it and make it stretch out. So if I do something like, all right, let's get rid of the absolute positioning. 
Pipe, pipe, pipe. All right, now I'm back to this. What if I do a span? Uh, I have to put something in it, so it was a really common trick to do what's called a non-breaking space. Otherwise, it doesn't render. And give this a class of spacer. And I say, all right, a uh, spacer has a width of 500 pixels. Oops. All oh, right, it's because it has that thing in it. Padding left, maybe. Too much. There we go. Okay, that's sort of kind of getting there. Yeah, it's on the next line. That's in line. Maybe the, uh, could have sworn in, uh, an unbreaking space that didn't do that, whatever. So that was another way to do it. The problem is, as soon as we change the size of the viewport, it doesn't come along with us. And it goes down to the next line when you try to break it. So about five years ago, uh, a tool um, came into vogue called Flexbox. So Flexbox fixes all of our remaining problems with CSS. We can do things like this dirt fucking easy. The magic trick with Flex is you define a box as a flex box, and then you have tons of control of its direct children. So if I want to space these two things out like this, what I need to do is put a box around them and flex it. And you can tell a flex box, I would like your children to be out to the sides. I'd like your children to be evenly distributed. I would like your children uh, to be vertically centered. You can do all kinds of cool shit. So do we have a natural box? Crikey, yes we do, it's the header. I will caution you against just making elements on the page to display something a particular way. That is a losing battle, always. How something is structured and how something looks don't have anything to do with each other. And in fact, with Flexbox, we can make shit show up in different orders if we want to. But don't just willy-nilly throw wrappers around just so that things have surrounding containers. Because the truth is, if this does need to be positioned out a certain way, that probably has some kind of semantic relevance. And hey, what do you know, it does. They're both in a header. So what I'm going to say is my header let's throw that down here and let's say this is display flex. And I would like to justify these children to be space between. And then when I go back to this page, hallelujah. And since that one kind of like that, I can say I would like to align those vertically centered. Pretty cool. What does space around do? Space around does the exact same thing, but I'll see if you can figure it out. If I change that to space around, can you tell? Space on the center? Sorta. Sort of. Space between, no space on the edge. Space around, oh. it takes whatever spacing you're doing, cuts it in half, adds those to the end. We can say, Flex start. 
everything's to the left. We can say flex end, everything's to the right. We can say center, piles them up in the center. But those, oh, we'd also do this. Check this shit out. It's kind of cool. Uh, I can say the flex direction of this should be column. Now they're on top of each other. And one more crazy one just to screw with you. What if I uh, want that heading to be second just for purely visual reasons? How about, oops, fuck. How about that menu is first and that H1 is second? And then I make that rows again. They flopped. And I space between. They're opposites now. And then I get rid of that order, and they flop back. Flexbox is powerful, 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 powerful tool. But the thing that I was just trying to demonstrate there, it does not respect document flow anymore. You're doing it, you're flexing it. You're not using the document flow. You're explicitly saying you don't want to use that. Yeah. Ah, that's what I was looking for. Um, yes, that is Flexbox Froggy yeah. is right there. Um, and there's a related game for Grid, which we're not going to talk about today, but um, Grid is another not document flow tool for aligning items. And it's how on the developed Denver site, if any of you noticed that, this uh, uses a pretty strict grid system. And so if you've ever done any print design before, it's a nine column grid. And so you can say, I would like this to take up this much grid space, I'd like this to start on this grid line. But I'll give you guys some resources for that also. So if you need to do any cool positioning shit, you probably want to reach for flex. It's a good Swiss Army knife for that. For example, if I needed to vertically center something inside of a box, pretty common design tax, task that is next to impossible to do in just regular document flow CSS, I can make a box. And inside it, I can put a span that says center. And all right, so I got that. I'm going to say the box is going to be 200 pixels by 200 pixels and have a background color of blue. Cool. Getting this to actually show up in the center with document flow, good fucking luck. Um, so what we can do to make that show up in the center, I can make that a little bit more visible. I'm going to target the P, the span inside of it. I want a span that is a direct descendant of, the, of anything with the box class. I'll make the color white. Cool. Up the weight. Paint. I can say I would like to flex that and I want to 
Justify the content center and align the item center. Believe it or not, that was super hard to do like five years ago. What were those last two lines of code that you did? Justify content is where is it positioned on what we call the primary axis. Align items is the exact same thing on what we call the cross axis. By default, it's left to right as the primary axis. That's the flex direction row. You can also flip it, and now that's the primary axis, and left to right's the cross axis. And if you'd like a reference for that, because the thing I just said with words doesn't make any sense, because it doesn't, uh, Guide to Flexbox gives you awesome visual reference for all of these things. And uh, as Dan alluded to, Flexbox Froggy is a terrific way to get very comfortable with all the things that Flexbox does. So your goal from the standard site is to be able to recreate this with HTML and CSS. If you can do that, you know about enough HTML and CSS to get through this program. With that in mind, this is not have to be the last time we ever talk about HTML and CSS. That was an awful lot for a day. What questions do you have? Or like, uh, in this case, links to a site. I think that's just supposed to be an anchor tag. But it's supposed to be right aligned. Good question. What else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. In fact, I believe that's what the instructions tell you to do. Um, Company or business of your choice, real or imaginary, uh, and create the landing page from this layout. So I encourage you to play with the colors, the typography, that kind of stuff. What else? Okay. So uh, I'd recommend continuing to work through those MDN guides on HTML and CSS. I play around with Flexbox Froggy. It'll solve some core challenges in this. Uh, the grid stuff is bonus. You don't have to use grid. Uh, you don't need grid to do this, and this is how far you need to get. And then we'll start talking about JavaScript. Um, neat. Crank on that for the rest of the day. Oh, one more thing. Be real clear on those selectors because we use those in JavaScript a lot also.